up with a quote, but just before entering here, that little earthquake really scared me. You seem very calm though, so it must have been my knees shaking due to stage fright. <laughs> anyway, the quote, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. It's a great quote from the use of language point of view composition. I like the wordplay in it, and I fully disagree with it. I disagree with it because I teach fear. You see, I work with people who survived a brain injury from strokes, alcohol, due to car accidents, and I've seen many examples where having no fear is extremely dangerous. This is a story of one of my patients. He had a hemorrhage or stroke in the right hemisphere, and that usually means the left side of the body is affected. The impairment depends on the, uh, of the, on the severity of the stroke, and it can range from almost no symptoms at all to a vegetative state and even death. There are certain traits we can expect from right-sided stroke, and in the case of my patient, it was a very dense left-sided weakness. But apart from that, he had something what we call in rehabilitation a cognitive impairment. His memory was affected, as well as the insight into his problems. We can all self-monitor and self-evaluate. We know when we mess up completely, and we can usually tell when we've done okay. We have insights into our abilities. Unless we are in the karaoke bar, uh, and then everybody thinks they're doing great. <laughs> My patient wasn't able to self-monitor and evaluate his own performance at all. What's worse, even when presented with proof showing him his abilities, or showing him his problems with his abilities, he wasn't able to apply this knowledge and predict what problems he might face in the future. So, Patients with these types of issue would ask to go for a walk just after an exercise session during which they were un unable to lift their le left leg. When this is pointed out to them, they say something like, ah, if you sit me up, I'll be okay. Or, if I go home, I'll be fine. They are unable to draw logical conclusions. Now, this is very hard for healthy brains to understand but I think a good way of describing it is by an example of a weird and surrealistic dream. Um, we've all had dreams like this, I hope, or is it just me? <laughs> anyway, in a dream, everything makes sense. It sometimes makes sense a few minutes after we wake up, but during morning coffee, we suddenly realize that it was all crazy and none of it is possible. This surreal state of mind is similar to what patients perceive, they just don't wake up from it. The patient I'm talking about also had what we call neglect or inattention. We had a plan for him to put food on his right side so he could see the whole plate. One time, somebody forgot about the plan and this is what we found. Because the plate was directly in front of him, he was unable to see the left side of the plate, and so he didn't eat food on that side. So, if we were in Krakow, and we had neglect, we would see something like this. Now, this is only a visual representation. Try to imagine you don't perceive the world on that side at all. You don't understand and you are unable to comprehend that the world exists on this side. It took, me, it took me a week to help my patient to look to the left. I slowly moved from his right to his left, and when I got to the middle, he, he told me that half of me had disappeared, and he couldn't say where it had gone. Eventually, I managed to convince him to turn his left to the to turn his head to the left. And when he did that for the first time, he said, oh wow, there's a whole room on this side. So this is where all the voices are coming from. During that week, 
when I was trying to convince him to look to the left. He was trying to convince me that he'd be okay to drive his car. Uh, that day, when he discovered the left side of the world, he, was, he became really worried that he might hurt somebody because he might not see them. As you can all imagine, I was really happy about the progress, but when I came back after my weekend, he called me and said, Jacob, I know I can't drive because cars are too quick, so I decided I'm going to buy a narrow boat because they're not as quick as cars. We would all be terrified of steering any vehicle if we had all these facts. His perception of the same reality was drastically different. He did not feel any danger. He became fearless. My initial joke about the earthquake and my patient's story have something in common. They both talk about certain situations or such certain realities seen from very different points of view. And this is what I want to offer you today. Gavin De Becker said in his book, Denial is a save now, pay later scheme, a contract written entirely in small print. Now fear is seen as something bad, a negative emotion. We would like to get rid of it and often we deny it. But I want to invite you to see fear not as your enemy, but as your advisor. A very good friend who you ask, do you like my new hair? After hours spent at the hairdressers, and they look and say, it looks sh bad. It looks <laughs> we don't like the answer, but we know this friend wouldn't lie. So we quickly look for the nearest mirror. From my personal experience, um, fear saved me from becoming an alcoholic. Uh, after a week and a half of being constantly drunk, I caught myself looking for any scrap money I had left in my pockets to buy another beer. And it really scared me. Fear has shown me my future, and thanks to fear, I was able to escape an alcoholic fate. Another lesson fear taught me was in the mountains during one of our retreats. We were caught by a lightning storm in the middle of our trail. Now I have witnessed a lot of storms during my many years of trekking, but this one was different. It lasted about two hours, which in our minds was more like two weeks, and it possibly had something to do with the fact that there was lightning hitting every 30, 40 seconds. There's a rule during the storm Avoid next to a tree. Avoid standing next to a tree. As you can see, trees were everywhere. <laughs> so after 15 minutes of standing there, petrified, watching the flashes of lightning around us, we discovered that staying there is not really improving our situation. So we started walking again. And then something interesting happened. My vision became clear. It was like watching a program with, with David Attenborough on Blu-ray after watching a, a poor quality video from the 80s. My senses became very acute, and I realized I had been afraid of all those silly things, like little things, like problems at work, my career, what people might think. All this was fading away next to this huge fear of dying. And then, all the important people and, and things crystallized in my mind. This is very empowering wisdom that came from fear and that I use very often in my life. If, you, if you're a parent, think about your kids and the things they do. They appear fearless, and they actually are. The brains haven't developed enough to calculate risks, and it's up to us as parents to feel fear for them and stop them from doing, well, all those dangerous things of, what they on, of which they only think, nah, I'll be fine. Famous last words. <laughs> Stephen Pressfield wrote in his book, The War of Art, 
There is no such thing as a fearless warrior or a dread-free artist. We will feel fear throughout our lives, and that's okay. It's not about getting rid of fear. It's about learning the specific language fear speaks to us. Sometimes fear is wrong, like the earthquake I felt. Sometimes it might be right, but we don't have to listen to it. Like, we don't have to listen to our friend about a new hairdo. We can say, okay, fear, thanks for the info, but I think this time I'm going to do it anyway. I've got one last quote for you. The only thing we have to fear is the lack of fear. Me. <laughs> Thank you.